In this video I'll present my thoughts on the Zoom H2N Handy Recorder. I'll be looking at it from the viewpoint of someone who's owned a number of small solid state field recorders, in particular a Roland Eddy Roll R09 which was a groundbreaking recorder in its time and a nice machine although a little tired now. Its later high definition version the R09HR which is a wonderful machine an original Zoom H4 which had poor audio quality only one of the disappointments of this unit since it had poor build quality a very small display horrible user interface controls and poor battery life the Roland R44 which is in a different league and it's still my gold standard for a, an affordable field recorder a Roland R26 which has a nice large readable display but has poor connector placement and not very good battery life. A Tascam DR60D which has a terribly small cluttered display, very fiddly controls and appalling battery life. And an original Zoom H2 bought for its promise of being a self-contained surround sound recorder. So recently I decided to get a Zoom H2n as it seemed at least on paper to be a significant step up in quality and usability on the original H2. At this point I'd like to make it clear that I'm not going to go into a detailed description of the H2n and all its functions. There are dozens of review videos out there doing just that. These are simply my observations on particular aspects of this recorder, good and bad, that interest me. They may or may not be relevant to you if you're considering buying one of these recorders. First, build quality and appearance. I'd say that the H2N's appearance and build quality are good for what it is, a cheap device for occasional, non-professional use in relatively benign environments. Sadly, the battery cover is a lot less substantial than the one on the original H2 and its flimsiness becomes obvious when you have to put a lot of pressure on it to unclip it. Some reviewers have criticised the gloss black finish of the case, but I don't personally think this is an issue. The recorder is never going to be small enough to hide in front of a camera, so no amount of camouflage would help it. Also, most of the portable electronic equipment I've owned with rubbery outer coats tended to degrade over a few years and become tacky so I'm happy to make do with the shiny rigid plastic and try not to drop it on too many concrete floors. User interface. The original H2 had a miserably small display. The H2N is much larger with bigger text and is superb in my opinion. Although I'm not generally in favour of combined push button and cursor switches for menu navigation the one on this recorder works a treat, much better than the horrible membrane panel on the original H2. Although boot up and shut down aren't instantaneous, they're quite quick enough for most purposes. A wired remote control comes with the accessory pack, but I can't quite see the point of it. The H2N takes large enough SDHC cards to record continuously for the duration of any practical concert event, so why bother stopping and starting it? I appreciate that it can also insert chapter markers, but then again not all DAW software can interpret those. Battery life and power source management. The H2N uses the same battery arrangement as the original H2, two AA cells, either alkaline or nickel metal hydride. Compared to the H2 however, the H2N's battery life seems to be significantly improved. I can't see myself having to change the batteries as a precaution at the interval of an orchestral concert on this version. And the inclusion of USB powering is a great step forward. A cheap lithium ion USB power brick can be connected up for long duration recordings and if that were to run out of power, which is unlikely in practice, the recorder seamlessly switches to its internal battery power without any effect on an ongoing recording. This is brilliant. Just note that the USB socket on this unit is the older D-shaped mini USB style, not the micro USB used on current smartphones. 
Microphone Arrangement As I mentioned in my earlier video on the H2N, the microphone array consists of four capsules, not five as claimed in advertising. The lamps on the top of the unit provide confirmation, visible from a distance, of what microphone pattern has been selected. This can be a useful confidence check, but bear in mind that these lights do not indicate that the unit is recording. That's a separate LED and it's only visible from the display side. These lamps flicker if input level clipping occurs. This is just as well as the mid-side capsules point out from the opposite side of the unit from the display, which can be a problem if you are doing a selfie recording using the mid-side array, which gives a tighter central mono response than the XY pair. It's possible to connect an external microphone to the H2N via a 3.5mm stereo jack socket. This can be useful, but note that it replaces the XY pair, so if you intend to record with internal plus external microphones, using the four-channel mode, you're stuck with the internal mid-side pair. I'm not sure that this internal plus external combination is going to be a lot of use in practice. There aren't a lot of situations where the recorder can be placed in a useful position, say to capture general room sounds, at the same time as having a spot microphone plugged into it especially as a recordist would normally want to keep an eye on recording levels and maybe operating a video camera several metres away from the sound source. A further impediment to the internal plus external technique is that there is only one single gain control knob which is effectively ganged across all four inputs and this may limit the choice of external microphones. Input sensitivity. This is an important concern. Most recorders that have a common mic and line input socket provide a sensitivity range option, either via a setup menu or as a hardware switch. There would be a choice between mic or line, or between low or high sensitivity, or even a 10 or 20 dB pre-attenuation pad, but that is not the case on the H2N. Now this might not have been a problem if the range of gain on the H2N's mic gain knob was not so limited. So in practice a regular hi-fi line output connected into this socket will definitely cause clipping even at a gain knob setting of zero. And of course professional high output PA mixers and the like will be even worse in this respect. Some forum posts have indicated that loud rock concerts may even overload the unit via its internal microphones with the gain set to minimum. However, at low to medium sound levels, where most field recordings will be done, the improved noise performance of the microphone preamp compared to the old H2 is noticeable and very welcome. To check out the gain issue, I did some measurements using a sine wave input at a fixed frequency of a kilohertz, and here are the results. The total range of the gain control is just under 40 dB. Note that a gain knob setting of zero is not completely off, just the lowest gain, which on my machine meant that the unit was clipping at an input of around 550 millivolts RMS at that lowest gain. So, if you're intending to record from a line source, maybe a radio mic receiver or an in-house PA mixer, you'll need to make up a simple resistive attenuator. Interestingly, the input impedance of the unit is, as the manufacturer specifies, only about 2 kilo ohm. This betrays the circuit's role as purely a microphone preamp. A line input would normally have an impedance of 50 kilo ohm or greater, so I suspect describing it as a mic stroke line input is a little fanciful. But this does mean that a simple resistor in series with the input will suffice to reduce line input signals to manageable levels, I made up a connector box with a choice of 3.9K resistors, giving about 10 dBs attenuation for hi-fi sources, and 18K giving 20 dB attenuation for professional sources. That works fine, but it's just a pity I had to go to all that trouble. Surround modes. I'd normally record in the four-channel mode, which would give me both XY and mid and side patterns. I've not yet worked out what the effective polar pattern of the two-channel surround mode is. 
It may be similar to the Bloomline pair of crossed figure 8 microphones, but who knows. It's probably the least likely configuration for anyone to really use in practice. The latest version of the H2N firmware added a spatial audio file format, but this is a highly specialised format and I've not found any freeware decoder for it to date. It may be useful for those with 360 degree video cameras, in which case the manufacturer's supplied editor software may accept these files natively. Susceptibility to environmental effects. As with the original H2, and in fact all field recorders with built-in mic capsules, the H2N is very susceptible to the effects of wind noise. Fortunately, I found that the Rycoat mini wind jammer I'd bought for the H2 also fits the H2N, and is quite effective in moderately windy outdoor conditions. However, for close-up indoor dictation, the foam windshield from the accessory kit is generally adequate to prevent breath popping. The unit has some nice rubber pimple feet, which should give a useful degree of elastic isolation from a surface. However, this effect is somewhat spoilt by the front of the base inexplicably having a rigid pimple moulded into it, which projects just as far as the rubber feet. Other firmware features. The H2N has many special firmware features if you want to trawl through its menus. They seem to be mainly of use to musicians using it as a composing aid, and possibly note takers or reporters needing to perform basic edits in the field. However, with full blown door software being available at almost no cost in highly portable tablets and small notebook PCs or Macs, I can't see very many people using these features. For me, as a simple recordist, I turn off all of these features and stick to capturing straight two or four channel uncompressed WAV files in long, uninterrupted takes and sort everything out afterwards on my audio workstation. The Accessory Kit Finally, it's worth noting that my H2N came bundled with an accessory kit, which consisted of the following items. A remote control with an extension cord, which wasn't very useful as I mentioned earlier. A foam windscreen, which is good for indoor plosive control, but does need replacing with a furry wind jammer for outdoor work. A microphone clip adapter. Now this is not much use, but could act as a handle for interviews. A table stand, as it describes it, with three extendable legs. This is a cheap, small tripod and pretty useless, really. A simple zipped case that has enough room in it to put a furry windshield if you actually happen to have one of those. However, there's not enough room in there for an extra pair of batteries. And finally, an AC adapter and a USB cable. Although this is useful to have around, remember it doesn't charge the batteries in the unit, so it's useful only for long duration recordings close to a mains outlet. For such extended recordings, I think I'd prefer to use an external USB battery pack as I mentioned earlier. Summary. The Zoom H2N is a great little piece of kit. Its recordings are very clean, its mic patterns are very versatile, and the ability to record an external microphone is very useful. Its user interface is clear and simple to use, and its battery life is excellent. My only suggestions are that you consider, firstly, a Rycote or equivalent furry wind jammer if you're planning on doing any serious outdoor recordings, a lithium-ion USB battery pack for long duration recordings and some form of simple attenuator if you're going to do line input recordings from PA systems or hi-fi systems. Overall, I certainly think that for £130, including the accessory pack, of which the case was really the only useful thing, it was money well spent. Thanks for watching. <laughs>